I would say science is the, uh, the quest for knowledge about everything that makes up the world and the universe around us. I, I think science is just uh, constant studying of, of many different things like, uh, um, you know, we could talk about like, just like human life or, or, or um, the existence of, of all animals and insects and things and, and how the earth um, is shaped and, and how it functions and how everything works together. And um, I think science is such a broad topic and there's just so many things that um, you can dig into. But um, I think there's, there's things that science has proved and there's still things that are in the process of being proved. And um, I think it's a good thing um, that we keep studying and keep learning and keep growing about how our world works and how it's connected. Math, numbers, and being able to calculate different things throughout like everybody's day. Like math is something we use every single day. Physics is using the math to predict the motion of uh, objects and stuff like that. Science, I would say, is the study of everything uh, in life that's relevant to the way things move and interact with each other. Just like the understanding of how nature interacts with natural forces and things like that. Not bad, Pequay Valley. Other than Bankert's rambling, uh, everyone was pretty much on the same track regarding these questions. Uh, though, as the science and the STEM teacher, uh, I am going to point out some details that, uh, that we need to correct. Now, if we were to actually go out into the real world, outside of school, where, you know, people probably work their jobs and take care of their families and just don't pay as much attention to science as they did when they were in high school, uh, we would get uh, vastly different results and probably some, some uh, conspiracy theories and, well, as a science educator, uh, and a person that values the advancements that science has given us uh, and in response to widespread misunderstandings regarding the methods and the relative certainties of parts of science, I'd like to offer these definitions to you. Uh, plus, you're going to have a quiz or a test on it, so write them down anyway. Uh, the first question was, what is science? And the very, a very simple explanation is that science is the search for patterns or order in nature. So if we can figure out how the world works around us, the rules by which nature plays, we can take advantage of that knowledge to predict and plan for future events. We can create technology and policies that benefit human well-being. Uh, we can even change what happens in the future. Uh, so science uses the patterns and the order that it discovers in nature to our advantage. We can predict exactly when and where eclipses will happen. We can predict the strains of flu from year to year to make a reasonably potent vaccine. We can use electricity and semiconductors to create computers that give every connected person access to information. Uh, and we can establish well thought out regulations that protect our environment and our human health as well. So science is this search for the knowledge, but I do want to emphasize that there are three important parts of science. It's the content, the process, and the attitude. What do I mean by that? The content is that base knowledge, right? It's the facts. It's what science has learned and what you should know in order to discover new things in science or apply it to new situations, uh, to new technologies or problems. It's kind of like the encyclopedia or Wikipedia, Google search. Uh, focusing on the content is a common thing to do. And much of what we remember about our past science classes is facts, right? What is often ignored or forgotten is the process and the attitude of science. Or, as Carl Sagan puts it, science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge. That's my best impression. You can judge it if you want. So let's move on to the process because there's a way in which we find it out and that process is just as important. So the process here, the process is the means uh, by which science discovers the content. It's also known as the scientific method. So let's say you see a pattern in the way the world works. So you write that claim down in a way that it can be tested, either confirmed or refuted, supported or denied. Uh, then you test, you design a test 
that could either confirm or refute that hypothesis. Remember, only finding the times when your hypothesis is correct or is supported is known as confirmation bias, and it pretty much leads to being wrong unnecessarily. Now, about that test. See, the test must measure the effect of one thing on another, and it has to control for anything else in the world that might change the outcome. Uh, you run the test as many times as necessary to have a reasonable amount of confidence. And then you ask others to peer review your work and also reproduce your results. The more confirmations you have, the more confident you can be that your hypothesis or your results of your experiment are true. The objective truths are teased out through this self-reinforcing system and established not by any person in authority. It's not about who does it. It's about the process itself. That's where we get these facts. Okay. Then uh, this, the third part of this is the attitude, the scientific attitude. So scientists will approach the world and their work with a healthy dose of skepticism, with confidence based uh, or confidence assigned to ideas based on how much evidence is available for that idea. Neil deGrasse Tyson summarizes it this way. Do whatever it takes to avoid fooling yourself into thinking something is true that is not, or that something is not true that is. So in other words, you think something is true, you design and conduct an experiment that puts your hypothesis to the test. You make sure you not only try to prove your hypothesis correct, but also ways to disprove your hypothesis. That is just as important. And then we assign levels of confidence based on the amounts of evidence. We have sent astronauts to the moon and spacecraft to other planets using Newton's laws. So based on the mountain of evidence, we have the highest confidence in Newton's laws. Technically, however, the door is always open to these laws being changed or tweaked based on new observations. One example is string theory. Now, based on my understanding, string theory is, has a well-structured explanation behind it. However, there isn't really a good way to test it reliably. Hence, we have very little actual evidence of string theory. Therefore, we do not have a high level of confidence in string theory, so we are not able to use it. But that confidence will change based on new observations. If somebody finds new observations of string theory and string theory provides predictions that we can test and they turn out to be correct, then we'll have more confidence in it. But bottom line here is anything in science is subject to change. But let's move on to physics, since that you're in conceptual physics class, right? So what is physics? Well, it's the search for patterns of order in nature focusing on matter and energy and the interactions between them. So what we're talking about is objects moving, objects staying still, atoms, solar systems, baseballs, fluids, hydraulics, fossil fuels, wind energy, solar energy, electrical energy. Also, all of the interactions between those objects and those types of energies, including when matter becomes energy. Think E equals MC squared or energy becoming matter, like the Big Bang. It's a type of science, physics. Now, math, from the physicist's perspective, is a tool that is used for quantifying and explaining concepts. Quantifying means you're just assigning a number. For example, if a cop pulls you over and writes you a ticket for speeding. Now, would the ticket say, the uh, driver was proceeding pretty darn fast, faster than he should have been going. No, that's hard to enforce. When the cop says you're going darn fast, that's a subjective measurement, and it's only based on his or her judgment. The cop needs something a little more objective or not uh, subject to opinion, uh, and that should be not up to interpretation and not biased. And that's where measurements come in. So the cop could say, driver was proceeding through a 35 mile per hour zone at a rate of 53 miles per hour. That means it was 18 miles per hour over the speed limit. See, then the points, the suspension of the license, all that can be negotiated by the courts. But the math tells us exactly how fast you were going. How bad was it? How speedy were you? 
Math also allows us to explore the mathematical relationships between independent and dependent variables. So when we're testing stuff, we need to measure it with numbers. That way we can actually compare one number to another. How fast exactly does an astronaut return capsule uh, need to enter the atmosphere without burning up? How does the weight of an airplane affect gas mileage? These are all things that we need math for. I hope we wrote down all the notes that were important to you as well as a question to come to class with. Uh, so make sure your notes are full and you have a question to ask.